Austin, what are you, what are you doing, dude? I have this back pain. <laughs> yeah, but it looks like you're leaning. I, I'm leaning into my back pain. It's, yeah, it's a cure-all, really. Just it, lean more. It, <laughs> what, uh, what rate of perceived elevation do you think you're at? Well, see, there's multiple axes that you could lean about. Right, yeah. I could lean across the chair like this. Right, so... I so, could also back like this. So you have roll, yaw, pitch. Yeah. 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 So numerous axes by which you can rate your RPE. <laughs> so, you know, you need a complex 3D coordinate system. I see. There's no way you can keep this stuff simple. So there's not like a 2D like model <laughs> of leaning that's sufficient? <laughs> Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is training vlog number 23. We've got a bunch of questions, form checks, and instructions on how you can submit your own form check or your own question for upcoming training vlogs. Stay tuned to the end of the video for that one. First question comes from Jacob Kowalski. He asks, do you prescribe good mornings, back extensions, reverse hypers, glute ham raises, or Nordic leg curls for raw power lifters? Raw was in all caps because I don't know. Uh, why, why yes or why no? Uh, so I have prescribed each of these before for like general uh, force production development. Um, usually these are in GPP blocks or developmental blocks uh, very far away from a meet for power lifters. And the reason why is because I actually don't think that there's much transfer over to the big lifts um, that are com contested in a powerlifting meet like the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift. These are non-specific movements. The uh, principle of specificity suggests that movements that are of similar uh, muscle lengths, uh, joint angles, vo uh, velocities, and movements that are ultimately pretty similar have, are likely to have the best transfer over with a bunch of inter-individual variation, meaning that some people may love good mornings and feel like that does a lot of stuff for their, a, lo uh, a lot of positive things for their deadlift or for their squat, but I haven't seen that play out uh, routinely. So I don't program them um, very often for competitive power lifters or for very long. Uh, again, usually it's a general uh, development block or GPP, something like that. Uh, just not very specific and there are better options. Uh, that being said, some people will um, respond well to these type of exercises if you uh, uh, program them and they otherwise would kind of blow up on a lot more frequency of either the specific competition lift or a close variant if they see it too often. But that's more uh, the exception to the rule rather than the rule itself. Also, I don't know if, there, if I would make a huge distinction between raw or geared powerlifting as far as programming goes. I think that we continue to learn a lot about programming and how people respond to programming. And I don't know if the uh, uh, difference is actually gonna be that big outside of actually training in uh, the gear that you're gonna use for the for the competition so anyway i don't particularly love reverse hypers i don't actually program them hardly at all anymore unless somebody's got some sort of uh, emotional connection to them uh glute ham raises are okay i think there are better exercises to train the posterior chain if you wanted to isolate that for some reason nordic uh, leg curls i have programmed uh somewhat frequently for folks uh usually when we're working on a tendinopathy um, and then back extensions, I program uh, fairly readily for GPP stuff. Uh, good mornings, uh, you know, here and there. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my take on it. Uh, Caitlin Kilpatrick asks, how do you overcome decreased grip strength issues after breaking the hand? I broke my fourth metatarsal on my left hand twice, once back in October 2015 in a car accident, once in February 2016 from a rugby match. Ouch. Uh, I was in a splint the first time, cast the second time, needed no PT afterwards, no physical therapy, okay. Uh, now that I'm trying to lift seriously, the problem that I'm running into now is that my grip fails so much faster on my deadlift and just aches faster than my right hand. Would mixed grip help this? What are some exercises to help this imbalance? Uh, so Caitlin, yeah, I'm uh, you know, bummed to hear that you had these two fractures and that you're having these issues, but I actually don't think that there's an imbalance. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that somebody who had not previously trained with barbells before to have a great um, you know, uh, grip strength in, in barbell training just in general. And I actually don't think that your history of um, hand injuries really playing much of a role at all here, mainly because it's so remote um, and it's not unusual for people to have grip issues in general if they haven't previously trained their, their deadlift a bunch, especially if they have smaller hands. So um, 
if you needed a bunch of PT afterwards and had a lot of deficits after these uh, after the immobilizations, then maybe that would you know uh, raise some red flags. But I think if you d haven't had any symptoms other than uh, general you know grip weakness um, in your deadlift, then I probably wouldn't attribute that to previous fractures. I would just attribute that to grip strength. So here's my general algorithm to kind of work on. Uh, improving the grip for the deadlift. One, make sure you're using chalk. If you're not using chalk, that's going to be very difficult to overcome sweaty hands, um, you know, just due to the moisture there. Uh, if you're training in a Globo gym, I don't know if you have the opportunity to bring your own barbell or to even measure the barbells, but most bars in commercial gyms are not the standard 28 and a half or 29 millimeter uh, bars that we see in uh, either powerlifting competitions or good strength and conditioning gyms. So, in fact, I've seen a bar that is 33 millimeters in diameter at a commercial gym, and it was not like a squat bar or anything else. It was just a poorly made barbell that I'm sure the commercial gym felt like they got a good deal on. In any event, if you can use a regular barbell, that would be useful in addition to using chalk. Um, if double overhand's not working for you anymore, again, it's not a surprise that you're having issues gripping the bar if you're really trying to use double overhand. Um, even on your heaviest work sets, uh, I think that's not a viable solution for most people when the weight gets really, really heavy. And so in that case, you can try the hook grip. Um, that works especially if you have long fingers. If you don't have long fingers or if you tried the hook grip but it doesn't work for you, I would use the alternate grip. Um, and in general, people on their non-dominant side will supinate uh, their hands. So that'll be palms up. Um, I would definitely use whatever grip that you're planning on using for your work set for your last warm up. So if you've always been using double overhand so far and you decide to switch to the hook grip or the alternate grip, then I would use the hook grip or the alternate grip uh, at the latest on your last warm up set and then uh, use it on your work set as well. If you, if you find one of those options to be suitable in addition to using chalk and a correct barbell, then I would hold the last rep for you know 15 to 20 seconds, really work on grip strength there. If you don't find that either of those are suitable right now for the weights that you're pulling for your work sets, then I would use straps. And then I would, uh, on one of your back offsets or uh, uh, another deadlift variation throughout the week, I would definitely practice holding the, the barbell using either the hook grip or uh, the mixed grip just to kind of try to improve your grip strength with that. So that's how I would improve your grip strength with the deadlift would be deadlifting more. I don't think that farmer's walks work very well for this, mainly because the exercise is different, the how you hold the bar is different, or the implements are different, and it's just less specific than more deadlifting, which you have the opportunity to do. Uh, I linked an article below on uh, what, uh, me writing about deadlift grip, so check that out. All right, next question is from William Vanderstroos. He says, what are your thoughts on cluster sets for the squat, bench, and deadlift with one or two minute rest intervals? I see trainers program these around and go up to 20 cluster sets of 92 to 95%. So I assume you mean 20 singles at 92 to 95% of a 1RM, which is definitely not going to happen um, for anybody who's trained with barbells before. 90 to 92 to 95% is really heavy and doing those for singles anyway. I mean, that's like a single at RP8 or single at RP9 at the top end of that percentage. And doing 20 of those with a minute or two in between is just not actually going to happen. So that's just seem, seems unlikely. Uh, and further, I actually don't think that this type of setup is very useful for powerlifting or strength improvement if you're uh, gauging strength by your progress in the squat bench deadlift press for singles. Um, basically for strength development, you want some exposure to high intensity sets, usually singles uh, or something like that for powerlifting because that's the test. But you don't want that stress to out uh, to overshadow the adaptation that you get from that stress. So if you are accumulating a ton of stress but not getting a lot of adaptation, this is the classic light yourself on fire example. If you light yourself on fire, that's a lot of stress, but you don't get a lot of adaptation to improve performance uh, in singles for a squat bench deadlift press, then that's probably not a good uh, biological bargain. Um, rather, we like we prefer to use <clears throat> multiple singles throughout the week um, that are relatively, that make up a relatively low uh, portion of the overall training volume, but you still get regular exposure to the test. Um, and then we use other uh, higher volume work. So, you, you know, your, your back off sets or <clears throat> your volume sets to accumulate uh, strength development and uh, generate a hypertrophy response. So that's going to be that 70 to 80% range. And doing that in clusters, again, I don't know why it, you're effectively selecting for more of a 
uh, uh, different energy system adaptations rather than force production. So yeah, I don't really use cluster sets for that. Um, you can use cluster sets like a myorep type setup for strict loop, for hypertrophy um, type work. Basically, what, what you're doing there is introducing fatigue that's generated by the initial set, um, which is like which is called the activation set. Basically, you'll do a set of 15, 20, 25, 30 reps, something like that, and uh, you're, you're going to near failure, but you know about two or three reps shy of failure. And then on short rest, you're doing multiple sets afterwards. And basically, the fatigue that you generated from the first uh, from the activation set allows the subsequent reps to be harder than they otherwise would. And you can, you can verify this based on the velocity of the barbell. It's not quite as fast as the initial reps. Um, the effort, subjective effort of each set is fairly difficult. And uh, yeah, that works well for hypertrophy if you want to get the, hyper, uh, the hypertrophy, uh, hypertrophy response from a lighter weight. But from a strength uh, improvement perspective for singles on the squat bench, deadlift press, I think there are way better options. So I don't regularly use it. Uh, June Park says, after completing the Barbell Medicine 12-week press template, what should I run in order to continue gaining strength? That's my main priority. Uh, and also hypertrophy gains. I currently feel great, have no nagging injuries. So <clears throat> I think in general, our two biggest strength-focused uh, templates are the 12-week strength and the 12-week press. We just recently updated the 12-week strength. It's got a, a pretty different uh, setup the last four or five weeks, some different volume uh, prescriptions in the first few weeks and different movements that we've kind of uh, put in there based on the results that people were getting. So I think that would probably be the best bet. Although you could do a hypertrophy, uh, the hypertrophy template in between your strength blocks. I think that's reasonable, especially if you're not going to a meet and you don't have like this time, uh, this clock ticking in the background, like, hey, I got to be ready to go in 12 weeks. So if it were me and I just finished the 12 week strength, the 12 week press, I'd probably do the hypertrophy block, a hypertrophy template, and then go back into one of the 12 week cycles. All right, Brandon McCoy, this is our last question. Uh, really been loving the content. I've had three clients over the past couple months who are candidates for knee surgery. Each one has lost roughly 20 pounds and has been able to start a semi-consistent workout routine. All of them have knee pain while and after squatting and have, in my opinion, an abnormally flexible posterior chain. Uh, would they benefit from deadlifting more and squatting less, or would you have them continue squatting within a range that was tolerable? Uh, so there are a lot of indications for knee surgery, some better than others, and I don't. I think it's outside the scope of uh, not only most people's practice <laughs> who are watching this video, but also this, uh, this video in itself, we could go on for, for hours here. So just because somebody's a candidate for knee surgery, um, doesn't really mean much until they're actually decided that they're going to get knee surgery. And effectively, uh, the reason why someone, the reasons why someone would get knee surgery, because the, the risk of the procedure and the uh, potential, um, rehab, uh, those are, less than the potential benefits of the procedure. If someone has not gotten the procedure or is not scheduling the procedure because the risks uh, are outweigh the benefits, then they're not, a, that doesn't mean anything. That label is all it's doing is harming them by by giving it to them and they say, well, my knee must be shot. Now I, now I can't do anything because my knee. Um, that being said, knee pain in general, the general, the algorithm that we use after somebody's been cleared um, from any sort of red flag signs that would need them to be worked up immediately um, would be adjust the squat style. So you can switch to a wider stance, narrower stance, more toes out, less toes out. You can move the bar up, high bar squat, or if someone's high bar and go to low bar, you can try that. You can try front squat, safety squat, bar squat, something like that to see if there's a, a particular style or variation that is more tolerable than the other one. I'm not worried about slight discomfort during the training. I'm worried about pain or uh, that, that increases during warmups. It gets, starts to get worse. So I think that should be avoided uh, and try to break this sort of pain cycle that someone's in. Um, if you can't find a squatting style that works well for them, then I would go to something like a leg press or trap bar deadlift or something like that. And if you don't have access to any of those, uh, either a leg press or a trap bar deadlift, then yeah, you're going to do more pulling, more deadlifting in general, more RDL, stiff-legged deads, if they can tolerate that. Um, if you do find a squat uh, variation they can tolerate, then you're going to adjust the programming, which may be the uh, goal intensity of a particular workout. So whatever, like an RPE or average, you know, uh, or percentage um, to see if uh, you can get a, a handle on what uh, they can tolerate at the time and work that up over time. Uh, same thing with volume. If somebody, you know, gets knee pain with, you know, a certain amount of volume, then you would try to get a training effect with less volume, potentially splitting up the uh the that volume into multiple sessions if they can tolerate that 
Alternatively, if somebody can handle a normal training session once a week uh, with the squat but can't squat, again, uh, more, t more frequently without uh, generating some knee pain, then you squat once a week. And then, uh, uh, you know, maybe in the future, you can try doing a less stressful variant like the leg press or something like that. Um, in any event, I don't think any of this is due to abnormally flexible posterior chain unless they're just weak and subsequently don't have a lot of muscle tone because they're very, very deconditioned, but that is not necessarily connected either. I think I'm thinking that it is a abnormally flexible posterior chain, that seems highly unlikely. Um, and you know, the second part of your question was, I was wondering if you had any experience working with clients who have no knee cartilage left or very little. Uh, yes, I have. And then again, I think that the diagnosis that the, you don't get diagnosed with no knee cartilage or very little knee cartilage. You also, you know, that it, it, I wouldn't use that to manage somebody. Rather, I would uh, manage their symptoms because if somebody with no, you know, who had legitimately all of their cartilage removed in some procedure, or some traumatic experience that they ultimately had surgery for now have no knee cartilage left, but they can squat just fine, then what, what are you gonna do? Not squat? No, it's totally fine. Uh, on the other hand, if somebody has pristine knees on an MRI or other imaging, but they can't squat without horrific knee pain that gets worse during each set, then what are you gonna do? Tell them to squat because their knees are fine? No, you can't do that. So you have to manage each person based on uh, how they do throughout the workout session. That's what we do. So that's how I would handle that. All right, let's get into the lifting. This first one is Daniel Hollinger. This is 285. Let's click play. There we go. All right, we get to watch the walkout. Looks like a Velcro belt, which I don't like because they kind of blow apart at the bottom. But all right, let's check this out. Elbows look good. Yeah, I don't like that you're lifting your chin on the way up. I think you're looking too far down, so I would move your gaze out a little bit, but don't lift your chin on the way up either. The other thing is you're shooting your hips back out of the bottom, shooting your hips back. So I would keep your knees forward out of the bottom. You can tell because your toes are coming off the ground and you're lifting your head. So yeah, move your gaze out, keep your chin in place. Don't shift your hips back. Keep your knees in place out of the bottom. Uh, this is Rachel's 150. That one was high, that one was high. That one was high. Yeah, these are all high, so I think your stance looks a little wide from here. I can't verify that, so it might narrow your stance, get some lifting shoes, take a little weight off the bar, and you're going to go about two or three inches lower there. All right. So this looks like, what, 195? It looks like you're touching very low on your chest. I would touch probably an inch higher and probably flare your elbows out more. I think you're tucking far too much, but that looks very easy, my friend. This is Dr. Supples. We went to med school together. I think he said it was 225 for seven. Yeah, the, on the pause, the bar's scooting around a little bit, so I would try to hold a little tighter. Yeah, you can see the bar wiggling. Maybe it wasn't seven reps, but nice job, Mike. Just hold that pause a little more. This is Dr. Koch over there in UK. He's our surgery friend. Uh, if you like benching on your toes, that's fine. I like a foot flat so you can drive further back, but your bar path looks nice. Looks like uh, I would probably drive with your legs a little bit more on the way down so you didn't get that little hip kind of uh, pop there. And that bar needs to go back a little bit faster off your chest, particularly on that last rep. Some of the earlier reps were, were just fine. All right, this is Taylor Ridge 275 here. Let's check this out. Yeah, that one you yanked off the floor. That one you yanked off the floor. So you need to squeeze tight also. Uh, I would try to keep your foot flat throughout the whole rep. That one you yanked, you're not extending your low back. And at the top, you're leaning back instead of standing up straight. So just stand up straight. That one you didn't set your low back at all. And just, again, you're just yanking the bar off the floor. So you can look, see, he's trying to like really squeeze his thoracic spine into extension. I'd worry more about your lumbar spine. Just extend that and then push the bar away from the floor. Like the leg press, you stay a little tighter. Now uh, this is Dr. Nate Gordon. This be the doctor session. This is 315. You know, these look okay, Nate. I just, yeah, see, there's just a little jerk there. I would try to squeeze the slack out of the bar just a little bit more. Yeah, that last one was pretty good. Or that one was pretty good, rather. Let's see how you do on this last rep. Yeah, that, those last two were, were much better. The first three, you kind of just yank it on the bar a little bit. But pretty good, man. Pretty good. Bar path was good. Bar placement was good. All right. This is me, it's 5.45. So I started this week, this was last week. I was thinking, ah, I'm getting close to PRs, but I know also it was like week six or something in a row. 
of, uh, of development, and I, I knew that I needed a pivot week coming up. So that moved a little slower than I wanted. I'd rate that at eight and a half. This is 435. I ended up doing six sets of five here. Yeah, that one was a little forward. Watch my feet. Yeah, a little forward there. Let's see if I can stay back. Yeah, that one's better. Nice. Rep three was good. Depth is good. Rep four is good. Elbows are staying down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Let's see if we'll, I think I got one more set here coming up. This is my, I don't know what set that was, but I know this one was my last one. So basically, I started out this week thinking, ah, well, that one's too deep. I started out thinking, hey, maybe I got a little, some PRs coming, but uh, I noticed after today, after that squat single and then my bench single that I actually needed to go into a pivot week, which I did um, due to what you're about to see. But these squats actually look pretty good. Feet look all right. Depth looks good. Head looks like it's staying in position. So so I did a bunch of reps. Now this is 427 and a half. Um, yeah, bench felt great. I did 405 before this and it flew. So I thought all things were, were good. This one is just a, it's a bad rep. I didn't push it back um, fast enough. And so you can see it stall right there, stalled. I push it back a little more. Yeah, ran out of juice. So now I realize, ugh, maybe I need to do a pivot block, but I'll stick with the rest of the workout today. So this is 357 and a half. So this is my normal day one workout before I switch to the pivot, uh, pivot block. So yeah, that pause a little short. That was a little short. That one was better. Good. Butt staying down. Feet are staying flat. Bars going back. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'm okay. But yeah, I went, moved into a pivot, pivot block uh, on day two. So these are RDLs. I'm doing sets of seven. This is 495. So I think RDLs just deadlifts off the floor and then do RDLs. No need to be silly and walk it out of the rack. I think this is just fine. So yeah, you're just trying to do the top, uh, top portion. And I think sitting way, way back to where your toes come off the floor, that's wrong. I would just, you know, stay over, keep your shoulders over the bar and try to squeeze your lats hard. I don't know why I was pausing that last rep, but I do it on the second set too. But 495 for seven is pretty decent. The old RDLs. Yeah, again, I think walking out your deadlifts for RDLs. I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. I just feel like it makes it a little harder. RDL is always sub-maximal anyway, so if you can't walk it out or if you can't lift it off the floor, that's a problem. But I'm really focused on squeezing my back into normal anatomical extension, squeezing my lats tight to help brace that as well. I think I could do a little more thoracic extension here. That's okay. Nice. All right, so this is Leah. This is 145. I believe we got two singles for her here. That one flew, although it was off her leg a little bit on the left side. So her hips almost look just a hair high. Although, you know, this is 152 and a half. Getting ready for raw nationals. That looked pretty good. Might play around a little bit. I think her hips are a little high there. But uh, this close grip bench. Again, now we're on a pivot week. So I'm doing this for a set of eight. Main thing on the close grip bench is you're going to touch lower and you're going to tuck your elbows more, AD duct your elbows more. So... Yep, I have no problems with any of those reps. All right, and now we're in Toronto. So this is at Fortis Fitness. This is Thursday before our Toronto seminar uh, this past weekend. This is Leah, pause squatting 225. So that one's a little high. I think I yelled at her to go lower. I don't know if I yelled after this rep. <laughs> it's like, get lower. But these are two count pause. So it's one Mississippi, two Mississippi up. Um, and the angle I'm filming from is not the greatest for to tell depth because I'm above the hips. But, you know, that's right borderline. So I'd, I think after this set, I'd yelled at her a little bit. We'll see how this next set looks. So this is 250. Yeah, that's better. Let's see what this next rep looks like. Yeah, that one, yeah, it's borderline, you know. But again, I'm above her hip height, so it's really difficult to tell from this angle. Yeah, that one's a little high. I'd have her go lower. Uh, this is a terrible video just in general, but this is 405 plus whatever that Buffalo bar weighs. I think it's heavier. It might be 80 pounds. This thing's awful. Not because it feels bad, which it does, but because the knurling on the thing, it think that, that chewed up my back more than anything else. 
So I'm doing sets of seven, and uh, I kind of like it. I mean, the the way that it feels, other than it chewing my back up pretty pretty big. <laughs> I look like a goon doing this thing. But yeah, I'm mainly looking here to make sure my hips aren't shooting back out of the bottom. Yeah, that was okay. But yeah, that's one thing I notice a lot. And uh, when people are squatting, they just over-exaggerate that hip drive and the sh hips go back and keep your knees forward. But I did okay there, I think. So this is 405. 405. Yeah, touch and go bench. That was all right. Not bad after the, all the travel. And I think this is 325. Yeah, so I get the nice little lift off. Yeah. That looks pretty good. Uh, it should lock. That's yeah, a good lockout. It's a good lockout. So when you're doing touch and go, you're trying to get that stretch reflex without really like heaving it off your sternum. Not too shabby. All right. So hey, this is a uh, vlog 23. If you want to submit your own questions or your own videos, send them to media barbellmedicine.com. Please film them landscape 1080p or higher. You can use a Wii transfer or something like that to. Uh, to send it to us and we'll be happy to review it if it makes the cut. If you have questions, send it to the same place. Uh, hit subscribe if you uh, want to stay up to date on all the latest information, all of our latest videos. Hit like if you dug the video. Leave a comment below what you want to see next and we'll catch you guys next time. See you.